Good morning and welcome everybody. This is Tabo DRC Christian Leadership, Creative Leadership for the Body of Christ, open to all colors, all styles, all beliefs within the Christian ministry, the leadership ministry, and to the born again, Bible believing basically, but anybody else who's not a Christian is always respected, invited, and you know, you're always welcome, but my words are only for the Christian and those in ministry or leadership of some kind. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to be, we just don't want infamous if possible. So I'm going to speak today because I'm going to speak plainly and I want to address why I just appear as is. You know what I mean? Because I'm usually really busy going to, from one place to the next and I can go to my office and I can dress up or I can be on my mission and get a word from the Lord which is like normal people and just feel like, you know, I'm going to give it now because God, my God says he has no respecter of person's spirit. He is not a respecter of persons and bias or, you know, he's not competitive or, you know, rivalrous or just divisive like that. So I'm doing this because this is prior to the gym but also to get the point across, when I was out in DFW prior to this, I just got celebrity systemed out of it. And I had been raised not around celebrity, around E-O-R-R, -R, that's my word, equal opportunity, real respectful Christians that are down to earth every day respecting to anybody. And my dad was a pastor unsung not famous and so I know the real non-celebrity turf which is me really frankly me so when I was a newbie and I would lost my family I would lost my mate I'd been to college but I never went to seminary because the Lord said not to go on purpose my dad did but I'd been in ministry all my life for years and years in my own ministry then I realized that Lord sort of used that time prior to now. He stripped me of all evidences that I had had any ministry. In Virginia, I'd had like a presence, offices, helpers, key things, TV, media, but also fellowshipping around the area, writing for the newspaper at time, the Christian ministry newspaper. So therefore, I had a more proof that I was legitimate or whatever, but I was never a famous celebrity. I was there, however, prior to all this that goes on now, heightened media, and the names celebrity, you know, being attached to a Christian, I was always wanting to fellowship with the saints. I know that's the right thing to do, to keep you sharp, to keep you with the Lord, enjoy other people and have community. So I'd seen prior to, during the development of commercialism, packaging and marketing, getting your brand, our brand, because that's part of the world, but it also is part of the culture, and it's part of really, God has made a lot of this available. There's nothing sinful about marketing, all right? It's the need to teach a new depth. When it's not making disciples, it's making more critics, more judges, Pharisees, potentates, people who need to have the perks, power, and the seeming look. And then when I'm purposely sent to the grassroots, embedded to study the body of Christ, to walk it out for 45 years to do it, starting when I was 24, all my life in grassroots, all my life just being, you know, natural, approachable, Respecting all colors, all kinds of people, all kinds of faiths, everybody just equally because they're all equal. We're all equal in the eyes of God. We're all humans first. Never in my ever dreams would I have ever realized that I would resemble a certain kind of doctrinal stereotype at every time I went. The bastions of male... <laughs> <laughs> male capitalistic chauvinism I believe down deep good old boys good old boys and their good old girls in different kinds of ministries but it turned out it was to be the Levitical patriarch back under the law whether they're famous they're not famous whether they are gentrified which many of them are 
and which are not. But see, I could stand back because I've been around before all this, before all the nouveau riche, before the we made it big, trickle down to the bottom line where I live. The relationship affecting, strongly, strongly affecting the view of Jesus. The view of Christ following in fellowship. Now if I go to, because I love, I'm open hearted, I'm sent to the body, men and women, to God's people, for them to have at least a chance to hear somebody's different thought, and that is your choice, because I'm submitting it all as sila. Pause, think about it, evaluate, be like a noble Berean that would make Paul pleased, study it, see if it lines up with Scripture, New Testament, not under the law. So, in the New Testament, we're not against males or females or any color. We're into the Lord and letting him tell you, because I'm going to submit Selah, like Paul did, and let you, not dogma, but let you work out your own salvation, which is a mentoring comment, command from Paul. And he also, Paul, also mentored by praising and honoring the noble Berean who were Jews who picked apart his own doctrine to see if it really lined up with the scripture. So we are not in the Old Testament days of Levitical patriarchism. Apostle Paul, before he got converted and miraculously saved, he was a heightened Levitical patriarch. He was a heightened help, Hebrew Levitical patriarchism. All right? He wasn't Western European. So he came with his own bias, his own sense of justice and judgment, and accused the Christians through the eyes of the law. The legalism, the knowledge, his wells of great attained and hard work knowledge. That's how Phariseeism starts. That's how division, competition, accusing, false witness, all this starts. Haughtiness. You know, the Bible says later when Paul got alone and he heard God and he met the Lord, he would write things like this, which is our redemption. A mentoring comment from Apostle Paul Ephesians 3.19. He says to the churches, To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. That means he finally got it. It was revelation. There is a field of knowledge, maybe of prophetic skill, of knowing and acquiring information, even the gifts of many other people's choice revelations which is information to you. Yet, that is not eternal. It is not salvation. It is not humility in many cases. He said, even beyond attaining good knowledge, helpful knowledge, kind knowledge, teaching knowledge, <laughs> skills of the Spirit, music and talent, whatever, to know the love of Christ more. <laughs> Then, with the saints and the offshoots of TV well-produced minister groups, which I will clarify, I am not against the top ministers. It's just nobody knew to train people of what would happen after mega Hollywood media, all this went and big got a big stronghold. So I'll teach that another time when God leads me. We're not, nobody knows, now you do, you should train your people. <laughs> nobody knew that the famous, the renowned person, which is a Bible word, could be known, viewed from here, down here, as the celebrity, and then all the people who were raised poorly or poor, country, all wise, or really loving and true, which are all kinds out here, it's a mixture. Many people, nobody would have known that masses of persons would latch on to the famous face and they would say, oh, I'm going to be just like him or her. I'm going to, and wannabeism or ingratiating, sucking up to people to get in good with them, to be favor and get promoted. That is huge. Wanna, it is huge. Nobody knew that the, not the first guy that founded it usually, or the first woman. They didn't know that they would produce a bunch of victims out here. You know, they're not 
following pastor famous reverend like I am. Oh, they're out of order because we say so in our false teaching. They're, our doctrine is wrong, but we believe they're not covered by the patriarchs. All right. Nobody knew we'd have a bot, bunch of associations that maybe, you know, God did call for, maybe he didn't, that would have respecter of persons, club, spirit. Nobody knew that. I was born just at this right time because I could see prior to, during, and now, during the Jim Baker, Jim Swagger scandals, I had just been called to my own public ministry. I was teaching a Bible school, a Bible course, and, you know, Bible study in a assembly of God. This is prior to me discovering well. This is very respectful, nice people. So what we see today, you know, this hardcore, hard case packaging and pride and you know, associations with the famous <laughs> and some at the worst scale not that I would ever have been in their midst, the lifestyles of the rich and famous, which is on almost on TV, not not the ones on TV necessarily, but there's a, a spectrum. So if I had not been sent by God to study the body of Christ, from this point of view, not being elevated, but being instead later in the last few years packaged by type distancing typecast only in celebrity following ministers, then I wouldn't know to teach on it. But back in the day when the Jim Swagger scandals happened in Jim Baker, I was in the grassroots teaching. I'd had a pastor dad. I knew people are human. You forgive them. I didn't realize nobody did. The fallout of accusation toward ministers and Christians started then. But also, it started, it could have been a healthy thing if we just addressed it. It could have been a healthy thing to train people not to swallow every man's Kool-Aid, every person's Kool-Aid, to study their doctrine, which is what I'm going to tell you. So I was teaching, and I had a family member who had, who had put one of these men on a pedestal. And this person started to get cynical about Christian ministers. And that built and built and built, and I saw America go that way. Nobody at my memory stood up in the nation and said, let's address this and forgive them and talk about don't be an accuser. Later, those men repented. I am not about those men. I'm talking about what happens when situations like that do happen. The other person, I had a girlfriend at the time in my life that was a friend that would always say, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, this, you know how it is. So that person had donated to one of those that fell. And when that happened, she stopped, right? Praising the Lord like many. And this was years, eons ago. So I saw the fallout and I went to the Lord. I said, Lord, what about all this? And he gave me, he just said, Micah 7.5. So I opened my Bible to Micah 7.5. I'd never read it before. It said, do not put your trust, do not put your confidence in your neighbor. Do not put your confidence in the guide. Do not put your confidence in the one who lies beside you in the bed. Only put your confidence in God. And I thought, that's it. All we need to do as leaders, all leaders just sort of tell people along the way, you know, drop it out. You know, we're human. We're like Paul. Paul said, I've not arrived. I've not attained. He praised the Berean Jews for being noble Bereans to train people, God's people, to depend on God. To train people to be noble Bereans and then co-laborers together. So when that has never happened, it has turned out to be the opposite. That is how celebrity really took a hold and a stronghold. Too much. Where now I believe that a lot of people who are very smart. See, this is it. Let me put it this way. I am pro that God has to get your name out there and people can call you famous you may be technically famous worldwide globally famous that's not a sin i'm not accusing that i'm saying 
when that happens, as it happens, just train people. Keep on training and training your staff that it's humility and approachability and it's about a team and a family. That's what we need to do. If I were to say anything that has triggered me to understand bias, anti-me or whatever my typecast look is or energy, it's energy I think, and a female which I'd never had until Dallas, until now. And I'm not offended by it because God told me I'm not stupid. I know that's the devil. And God said along the way, his instructions were, if you see something, you bump into something, I allow you to see three times or more that hurts people, or my good witness of my name, train on it. That's why I'm doing it. This is huge, big, big, big in the United States. So, because I am not, the other part was, he says, and don't take it personally, take it prophetically. So I do. On my comments lately, because I know the crowd, oh, the long-suffering, it's her fault. You know, she's not famous like we, therefore, you know, it's her fault, she's offended. That is that is probably not the top celebrity, it's the followers of that celebrity I have to deal with. <laughs> the egos and the, you know, Paul got first-hand revelation from being with the Lord. All his helpers didn't. Same with myself. I have revelation that nobody else would have except me and those people at the top. The good quality at the top few have the organic revelation of the move. Their second in command, their spouses would not, even though they're really usually wonderful people. I'm finding that since I'm of certain age and a certain type, that it ain't I don't think it's any real founder that's ever, well, maybe I have had, ugh, I've had, not up here, but I found it is the people 10 years younger or more, really 10 years younger, not the 30s, no, they're fine. They seem to be okay, much less biased, much less prejudiced right now. And um, what I'm finding is that the old guard of the old move, the old now gentrified, got it made complacent and tired move are the worst because now they're resting on the laurel of the famous folk. Surely not all, but if I get the scale of false doctrine, in a, it's usually only the, the second in command under the famous person who's not like that. It has happened in more than one state. It's pretty bad. So we go and address up front. I'm not a cat, catty person. I'm not a behind the word, let's talk them down and accuse them. and malign. I don't do that. I'm to your face. I'm Proverbs 27, verse 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend. We love you. We're for you. And we're for the Lord more than you, but we're for the Lord and more people coming to see the Lord at your ministry if you qualify for this new move called the, I call it, I'm putting a name on it, like the future church. The, the remnant. Maybe the last move of God. God had told me. I'm just putting it all out here. God had told me a few months ago in June of 21, he said, every move of God that God has ever had, every move of God in a Christian sense is a rough draft for the next one. It's a rough draft, so everyone from the first church to now, from the 80s move to now, from this move, whatever it's turning out to be, whatever kind and style, is the rough draft for the next one. Nobody can say we own it, we arrived, we're better, we've attained, it's our move. That would be false. And you know how? You can first tell it because they have the scowl of false doctrine. <laughs> our move self-righteous, whatever, missing it and clueless of doctrine, community, you know. So my biggest nightmare is the celebrity offshoot. The biggest move, the biggest, the biggest, I would say the biggest accusers, vanity, and the typecasting come from celebrity. Not, and I qualify it as not been it has only been tongue-speaking celebrity only. 
I qualify, I know this stirs you up, but I'm not saying it's the top people, the top one. No, 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 no. It is not the top one spouse. No, 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 no. It is, once you get out there, they don't have the same pure heart, the same inner knowing, the same fear of the Lord, or the same responsibility to do it right that the top one has, so I'm for the top one. Now, I can go where I go now, and I don't feel this. It's not. You can have renown and a famous name and a famous face and tons of people, but you don't have the same spirit, whatever this is. KG, these people don't where I'm going. I can tell a difference. It's not, the false doctrine that produces it or the lack of love, maturity, maybe love, is not present like it does because it doesn't accuse a stranger. It's not white bias, colonial. It's not checking on me to see if I am, you know, it doesn't, it isn't cagey. It isn't all knowing like I've seen or blase. I've seen that kind a thousand times. You know, it's just one more weary Eli Temple I priesthood, jaundiced, jaded, misogynist. So when you have talked to somebody who's a <laughs> who you look looks like the newbie, looks like the novice, looks like the same old, same old, same old person, you have no clue. You are you all who are doing this, you have no clue who you're disrespecting. You have no clue. You have been visited many times, many kinds of shapes of people and colors in these biased, easily offended groups. In these biased groups you are that are legalistic in their own kind of legalism. You know, you can have, you can have groups that pride themselves, let's say, not being legalistic, not being back in the old day, but because they're a tribe unto themselves. <laughs> through the decades they've been doing it. Now they've trained everybody the way they want it and they have their own legalism and Phariseeism which accuses the newbie. The people who don't know that their customs are this way. You have to be this way. So we're just trying to make this more down to earth. Not so much people pleasing. Uh, not so much pride. Not so much... Uh, gentrified, all-knowing, whatever, asleep at the wheel. We're not trying, we're trying to make it down to earth, so I'm just letting it all out. As I remind you, instead of, you know, they're easily offended, they're white. <laughs> She's offended. Mark those, I can just hear them, mark those that, it says to mark those that are contentious, and I would say, Jude contending for the faith, Jesus Christ manning up, humaning up, tossing over the temple money changers tables of the making it big systems. I'm doing this because we know we're out there with them. We've been out there with them for years and years. We know the ministry think tank, right? The kinds that are the worst. <laughs> Self-deflecting. No. No. No, no. No, it's because their fault. They're acute. They're uh, wounded. <laughs> so we think, let them think that. But I'm telling you, Scripture, that you're wrong. <laughs> I'm clarifying it lately. I put a good comment Lord has given me. There is a difference we need to teach. A difference between unforgiveness. We, this is what it would mean from them. Some of them, this kind, they're unforgiving. They're unforgiving. They're in sin. We don't have to listen. Jesus came over and tossed over a few temple money changers because the zeal of the Father's house, he was contending for the faith like I do. And they would say now, PC, pop psychology ministry would tell Jesus, he's offended. He has unforgiveness, bitter root judgments against us. You know, he's going to embarrass his mother. Some little old lady would hobble up on her cane today and say to Jesus, Jesus, let not your good be evil spoken of. Another one would come over and say some Pharisee, Jesus, we know you've got issues. 
a lot of baggage. You need to go to our Fix You Fast class. I'll sign you up for four weeks. This is what we've seen. This is what we've been seeing in America. All right. So we teach some discernment, clarity. All right. There is a difference between having unforgiveness, which, you know, unforgiveness toward a ministry and contending for the faith where they're really false in their image of Christ and their doctrine. All right. We can say there's a difference between forgiving and then being fed up because you know it never stops. It's keeping on going. It's going now to permeate to the young. It's going to block the future church from manifesting the Christ and the Holy Spirit because of Phariseeism. That's what I'm doing. All this is. If I see you, I will always be your friend. I will be always like I have in every situation, in every church service, time of attending, being somebody's house, their ministry, their business, in my life, I've always embodied, trying to be, James 3.17, resembling the wisdom that comes from above, that is pure, peaceable, easily entreated, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality, and that's me. This is why. It's, I'm alerting you, you're not getting it. You, some of these false teachers, they will spy me with unclean spirits. They will spy a person, diagnose them without, I call it deep scan. They will diagnose you without ever speaking because they don't relate. They have no fear of the Lord. They will diagnose you because they're so skilled, proud of it. And they will then pronounce and accuse you of being this whatever mean devil that they have seen in the past, and then they'll warn everybody on their team about it. I've had this happen. This has happened more than twice, different states. Because I am a prophet seer, and I can read their mail, which I don't read their in a the wrong way, but I have got to have my, to do this, it takes some kind of <laughs> fear of the Lord and seerish skill. <laughs> But I went, wow, there for the grace of God go I. Black people never do this. Baptists don't do this. Catholics don't do this. Normal people in good, healthy doctrine never do this. Most denominationals are safer right now. More respectful. Not so self-preserving and so holier than thou. Prophetic knowledge. It's disgusting. It really is. It's it's frightening it's been very frightening occult it's occult it's psychic it could be telepathic i call it more like after i've researched it and studied it for 30 years around the nation yes you can scan somebody you should scan somebody you know do i what do you tell me lord about them should we trust them or not you know but you keep your eye on people you can't trust everybody there's nothing wrong with being a healthy assessor you assess them and scan them keep a watch but if you never speak and you're there is a difference when they get the scowl when they get the scowl of haughty but false doctrine you know you are accused silently without ever being spoken to. Here I am sitting there, friendly, peaceful, calm, and yet circled around in one place <laughs> in a mega church one time. I felt like I had like 10 to 15. They had appointed scanners all over the place and I was being scanned. As a prophet, I knew it. Do I unforgive them? Forgive them? Yes. But it is false. It is something invasive, and it is. I'm a office prophet, seer, and all five offices, and mature. I'm just on assignment, not famous. It is defiling. I've been defiled repeatedly by that group, that white group. It is satanic in the fact that it is so cultish, occult, psychic, invasive, and will not love me enough to speak, will not respect the new visitor, the recurring attender, to love them. 
That is the lowest bar of real fellowship. I've said this. Now, now first of all, I go back to Billy Graham days. Reverend Billy Graham, that's what I live. That has been a hero role model of Christianity, fear of the Lord, a real witness for with an eye on eternity, the perspective that's valuable, open to all races, all right? Not clubby. When I come across this satanic false witness to the name of Jesus that accuses strangers by typecast and evil eye, this glare of false teaching, it makes me concerned for their souls, not mine. I'm not offended. It is pitiful. Get out. YouTube. Get two or three Billy Graham sermons and listen to them. Get your perspective. Get a grip on it now. Get a grip out of the occult into the Holy Spirit. I've said this too, and I'll warn people. In the future church, this won't hold up. This thing will not hold. That's satanic. It has gone from the, it has gone from the scanning, to preserve, protect your ministry, which is healthy, to deep state scanning occult, and I know it. It has gone, perhaps. That's why I'm training them because I love them, and there are a lot of these, a lot of these. Matthew seven twenty two. In the last days, Jesus will say to the prophetic groups, it looks like he's mentioning only spirit-filled tongue talkers. Matthew 7.22, he uses faithful or the wounds of a friend because he loves them. He warns everybody, every teacher, every prophet, every evangelist, every fivefold office and minister. He says, many of you will say to me, Lord, Lord. Didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I lay hands on people in your name? Didn't I cast out devils and do wondrous works in your name? And he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. You who work lawlessness. When I looked up lawlessness in the Strong's Bible Concordance, it means false authority. If you are going over to the witch-watching spectral evidence like was used, Google spectral evidence, with this kind of same group, patrician, Roman patricianism, elite, over, you know, control, and spectral evidence. Spectral evidence comes through the same kind of spirit, misogynist, all about us, anti-female, occult. Spectral evidence was used at the Salem, Massachusetts witch trials as real evidence, and they murdered women real women. What it is, is that they would get a vibe, a dream, an impression that somebody was a witch. And they would take that to court in the court in the colonial days, accepted it. You Google Cotton Mather on Wikipedia. He was a major whelp. He was elite. He was highly intelligent. His father was the president of Harvard, Cotton Mather. He was a whelp, Western European Levitical patriarch like this similar group that does this, the cult group. He had great influence in the Salem, Massachusetts witch trials and spectral evidence. Highly educated, he wanted to be the president of Harvard like his father. His father had an unusual name. I can't remember what it was. It was like intellectual or something unusual. His father, when I read about him, but they didn't want him. They didn't want him because of his weirdness in spectral evidence. And that kept him out. So there was an elite quality, high IQ, discernment, mighty gifts, very pleasant people, but they can be off. So we're pro all of you, even if you do that, because nobody knows, you know, we're all human, but we got to shape up. That's the issue. How can we... <laughs> We don't want to be caught with the masses. Can you imagine how many masses of people God will tell that to that are shocked? I thought of that many before I moved up here. I thought, that's when I, I mean, I, my fear is before 2020, I'd gotten a word that God was going to 
send a Holy Spirit flush of his mighty wind. That was in 2019. And it would be refining, cleaning up ministry, and then COVID happened. When COVID happened, I thought, doesn't surprise me. God's just needing to reboot his church, his ministry. It's not ours. It's not theirs. It's his ministry. Now I've gotten, I have really been through the refiner's fire. I've had cruelty from certain ministers, certain kinds of their doctrine, false teaching. I've forgiven, but I have been reduced to minus in my personal living, in my personal estate, because I didn't feel I could suck up to anybody. I didn't want to. I don't please people. I'm not their doctrinal stereotype. I'm not a people pleaser. But on the other hand, that's part of an apostle's call. I do not feel sad. I feel the most joyful, liberated, and calm and contented as I ever have. Apostle Paul was the off-scouring of the world, not the famous celebrity. I'm the off-scouring of the world to the Christian mega TV famous. That's all. Doesn't matter. I'm here to teach them how if they don't shape up, some of these don't shape up, you're going to be there. You really are. I've known this for how many years? Four to three to four years as a prophetic sign unto you, like Ezekiel. Do I care for them? Yes. Do I love them? Yes. But do I need to be, because I am very caring for people and loving, do I need to be around that spiritual, demonic stuff? No. Why? Because you know why? It's not a scriptural. It doesn't look like Jesus. It doesn't act like Christ. It doesn't act like Paul. Paul was not a Pharisee. He was not a do-gooder. He was not a... He was liberated. He was not back under the law looking to see who didn't measure up because he did. So it only, all this has only made me get bolder, more joyful. Thank God for my natural parents who are Christians, all the Christians that are not so weird in their doctrine. And I really respect people who do not go to church now more than ever. And I see your point. It's, you got a valid point, a lot of you. I really respect the African Americans for not doing this. They are so, to me, they're on fire more, in more depth, in quality from their youth up. The African, the black people are, in my opinion, than the white. On, in, you know, if you look percentage wise, I really think, and I'm not saying, but I'm trying to stir you up. This is to stir you up, frank talk. When the t going gets tough, the old saying was, the old mantra was, when the going gets tough, <laughs> the tough get going. I'm going to pull myself on my bootstrap. No. When the going gets tough, listen, you run to the Lord. When the going gets that tough, you run to the Lord. So if you are ever in a horrible situation, long-term, extreme fiery trial, call me up. I live there. I am great at crisis. Through my years, I noticed that when people are in, you know, I'm a sheep herder, not a, sh I'm a shepherd. I really am a pastor, but am I, I'm more of like a sheep herder. I don't want everybody and they don't want me. I'd rather have God send me the right ones. And then you come, I don't own you. You're not under me. You're just a co-laborer. And if I can, you know, give advice or be there for you, I'm fine. But I'd rather have a few hand-picked God sent that are called and do well by that. Mentor, whatever. Then have crowds and not be as good. So I believe that if you want to bounce stuff off of me, I'm here for the community. More than, more than anything else, I'm here as a resource for the community. I'd rather refer you to the kind of church that you feel is your fit. That's why I love the body. I study the body to see who's worth, who we can trust to send people to. I'm a sheep herder. Let me find a sheep in the field. I'll herd them your way and not hurt them. Try not to hurt them. If I would say anything to mega ministry, long-term mighty mega ministry, long-term, I would say stop stereotyping. If you've gotten so lost and self-centric 
that you can't relate any more to the common Norman people who have heard all the media in the last 30 years and are excellently gifted and smart, can train you on a few things, and me. We got to know this is a team and community, and that fits with the Bible. Apostle Paul, Ephesians 4. Everybody has their strengths. Some have more elevation than others and blah, blah, blah. You know, all that. I would say to educate, frankly, to educate the quality, wonderful founders, and their, but mainly their staff. <laughs> the ones that are hired by them. <laughs> they are the nightmare. They're used many times. Not where I go now. But when they have that false teaching in their midst of the cult, that's where it is the worst for me. Biased and proud. Anyway, I would train everyone. When you see, a new, everybody's got a new visitor, never presume, never say, oh yeah, it's just one of those seniors, it's just one of those black people, it's just one of those obese people. It's just one of those countless thousands we've seen and come through and we've heard it and now we're used to it. This is not one state. This is many. Clubs. Immune. Immune. Let's start again for the future church. I see a human person first, not the organizational stereotype to be filed conveniently into that age group, that, you know, whatever, look, that appearance, that race. You see a human first, get made in God's image. Each human has a backstory. That's what they don't know. It's not your backstory. It is their backstory that could come from the Middle East. It come from could be plain. It could be fancy. It could be abused, just coming out of being almost murdered the night before, before they got to your church. You do not have no clue what people go through out here, and you have forgotten, or you just never went through it yourself, so you don't care. You haven't got a bead on the real people. You've lost it in your iconoclasm, iconoclast, efficient ministry. This is here as a resource for you to remind you, go for the harvest. Go for the non-famous. Don't go for your type. Don't go for your gender. Go for the human. If I get biased against one more time by the same crowd, it's so discouraging. Oh, yes. Let's write her off. She's a, she is this age. She is this look. Hey, I hope I'm breaking those stereotypes down. I don't... In my own personal chronological age group, I never fit. I don't think old. I do not think old. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. I cannot think old. I think current. I think grateful that I'm here this long. But I think I'm trying to get people now everywhere to take inventory. A lot of what you're thinking, clubby types, is built from TV media packaging stereotyping formulas that you've heard watching TV or in your neighborhood or your peer group. I don't do that. I'm for you, but I think we got to break out of the generational age look mindset. It's a minefield, but also train the people that go to your churches. They're in this minefield too. So listen. Oh yeah. Yeah. Over the hill, not current. They would never think rock music or anything, or any kind of thing. They would never think intellectual. They would never think, oh yeah, she's got intellectual theology. No, no, no. She's just, uh, you know, write me off because, oh, it looks like your mother. Uh, we don't want any more of those. See, I'm not offended by any of this. I have been around, and I'm fed up with it. I am not offended because it doesn't bother me. I, I feel that on... There for the grace of God go I, but I'm in the field ministry. I'm not the slave driver overseer. 
I'm in the field ministry for such a time as this to help with the harvest, to help the new pastor never get this way, to help the female, the male, the black, the brown to feel equal and not judged. I feel like you got to go now, everybody, and really be careful to be your own person, study the doctrines and teachings you let give permission to come into your life. Be careful who you pick to sit under. You pick. They don't. I had people years ago when I first got started getting, wow, noticing accusation when Baptist, when black. It was the country law good old bark person group that had gotten it off TV. <laughs> that's the subculture that's been to my nemesis. The good old boy culture. Good old boy culture. Got it off TV. Now they're dogmatic and autocratic. and But not all. And I forgive them. I really do. It just got my attention because I was raised the opposite. <laughs> I was raised the I never heard of this before. I wasn't a charismatic. I wasn't a, I was not a, I was a Baptist. They're respectful. <laughs> They're all trying to be diverse. <laughs> so anyway, so for the sake of the saints and for the sake of the Lord, you know, he's looking for hay among the stubble. We're looking for what in the, What's first church and what's now church? What's first church and what's famous church? Let me ask that. That's the point of all this. What's going into the future that represents Christ and which does not in ministry? I'm calling it, let me make a title for this ministry segment video. What is future church versus famous church in leadership? Because my experience would now encourage, tell the top leaders, train your people, your staff, your helpers, your elders, your scanners, your followers to not put you on a pedestal, to not swallow all your Kool-Aid, to not have respect of only certain kinds of persons that look like you, all right? So this is why we're doing it. We're being very, very forthright. I'd rather please the Lord than man. Now, on the other hand, I have never felt so joyful, so mischievous, so full in my life. I really have not. And one thing I did pull away, <laughs> I had to get away. I didn't realize I, am, I really am a prophet. That cult spirit, occult spirit, where they're trying to read your mind and everything, it is just damaging. It is just, it is just terrible. And I had to pull away. And after a while, you get out of a cult feeling, a cult where they're scanning all these people of different, you know, all their trained people, 15 people. It, you have to get out from that. And it takes time to get free. And so I'm here to help people. In the hay and stubble, you can have a cult spirit. Smells like cult spirit to me. It is. But that doesn't mean you can't be delivered and just, you know, ask God to heal you, show you how to teach better. So it's not anybody that I would know now, maybe the couple in the deep, deep south, that are too far gone, that are too in it for the showmanship or whatever it is. But we are pro the body of Christ, and I'm really pro the individual a lot more. And an individual can have a huge mega ministry with many campuses or not, and a huge, a great individual before the eyes of God that God thinks is a great individual could be out in the field a young person. Or a person who scrubs the floors, takes care of the poor. They're equal. So when I've gotten... Finally, I hope I'm getting past the teaching on whelp, the sidetracking whelp. I really am going to focus on the least of these. That's my love. You know, you can have a Solomon call, more visible. You can have a Mother Teresa call, they're equal. But I really have a heart to invest in people who help the other, you know, the people that are not well off. Because 
many times before Dallas, I used to get quality, gifted, and talented, unique individuals to be my helpers. And I would bring them out, give them more encouragement, and you know, help them get going. And they would help me. And I would, you know, they would, I would mentor them, and they would help me as the staff, volunteer staff. And I would help them get their office, get their ministry going, and more confidence that they were really called because they weren't used to that, the kind of mentoring. It was lost <laughs> back before here, you know, in Dallas. It was like, it was the roughest. I have never been in a rougher, a rougher ministry place in my life. And I am well-traveled. I do not know what that was. If it was poor me and plain old poor. Country all wise. Got a Bible in your hand. And a, you know you now know it. Because you can hit anybody over. I mean, it was just a pitiful thing. And I just. Uh, lawless is the word. Lawlessness. And is that everybody know. But it's so huge per capita in that nation. That it represented me. The need for me to speak out. Because it's everywhere. Some of that mostly charismatic, is everywhere. This is not the season for that anymore. It's over. That that caustic, toxic, displeasing, shallow Christ following is over. That's no more. God's not going to let that. That's not future church. That's our church. My church. That's not going. So I'm just sharing that, submitting it to you as a sila for you to, you know, Think about, see if it's true or not. Anyway, God is good. His His mercy endures. Here's my prayer. The Lord just had me almost say it. What got taken from me and time out from it was my worship, my music. And I am a musician and a CCLR songwriter and a composer, prophetic psalmist, and I can get spontaneous worship going. But that was completely robbed. And I would like God to... My, to, to have prayer and the right contacts and the provision, really the provisions needed to get my supply back, really for that, that, that God would send that. Now, to send us the right location. I have a location right now, an office, which I like. It's small, but I, I mean, it's a great office. But the idea is I really need to get a recording situation place. And I need to have a place that is, I can, you know, collaborate with musicians and do that type of thing. But it will be only God providing and showing and revealing where that's to be and who that is supposed to be with. So we all we want is you to be on my team to pray about it. Pray for me when the Lord says, pray for the upgrades of myself as well as my life as well as the ministry for his sake for the gospel's sake and to get out into the community back where i used to be before dallas you know dallas thank god for dallas i like dallas i like texas i like a lot of the people i just don't like religion a spirit of religion a contrived fakey religion i do not like it and when you go to the tongue talkers which is my field I called feel Holy Spirit. That's where it was. So anyway, we are doing this. I'm doing this because what I saw, what I have seen in the name of Jesus Christ following in his ministry and leadership made me pull back. So in 2002, I dropped my nonprofit as a prophetic sign. I got out of God removed me from being a charismatic, even though I do talk in tongues and believe in the Holy Spirit. I am not a charismatic because of all what I've just said today. So I run this as a business. Tavo Creative Leadership, DFW Leader Online Ministry Fellowship, until God says, somebody do it, you know, take over and figure out the nonprofit side for me again. So what you're doing is when you give, as you give, you do it as unto the Lord, which is what you should. Back in the day... Prior to the fabulous day of ministry and legalism and all the things that we know now, the first church lived by prayer and fasting. They didn't live by nonprofit 5013C. I really felt, I'll be honest, I felt like we don't know what the government will do or not do. I felt like 
I'm not going to monkey around with the, the 5013Cs could be outlawed any day. I thought that for years. So I'm being bold and proven. I'm going to go out and see what God will do. So I've just believed by, I've, God has kept me this far. It hasn't been beautiful, but it's been, he's kept me alive and he's provided and I feel really young and I feel great. I have been believing God to, he will provide to take me where he needs me to go. It's been unusual, yes, but I'm a forerunner, a prototype maybe for certain kinds of folk, a few. So when I'm sharing this, I'm to tell you it's a business, God's business, to please him. I'm not bought by anybody, but I'm not perfect either, not, not trying to be elevated. All right, but the issue is when you give, you're giving like first church. You're giving if God says to please him, and here's your scripture. You give into, to sow into, in a Matthew 6, 4 way. It says, give in secret, and the Lord will reward you openly. So don't tell anybody. You and God figure it out, whether it's $3 or whatever. You hear God, you have to hear God, and then you sow it into the ministry. The 501, I'm not a 5013C, you will not get you know any kind of proof or any, that's why I think it's good to give small many people small from three to sixty dollars let's say or any but you know if God says more somebody's given more but I think you it's because of you and your faith not because of me putting pressure or any kind of weird contrived legalism you hear God for the future church if there's going to be one and you sow into this, the online, it comes up as DFW Leader Ministry Fellowship, which is the <laughs> real reason we're teaching. <laughs> I like this. But you're doing it as unto the Lord in Matthew 6, 4. Give in secret, so that the Lord will reward you openly. Now this, to me, is so interesting. You give to the Lord, whatever, he multiplies it back whenever and in however shape he feels you need. That's all. Pretty cool. So this is a new technique, you know, a new prototype for, for um, collections, offerings, tithes, whatever. And I have a whole teaching on prosperity and giving on money later. I've done it before. You're giving not to get. You're giving because you are allowed to give because God says, and because you're pleasing Him. You know, there's scriptures, like I said, give in secret. That's His thought, His idea. But there's no figure attached to it. There's no definition. You're going to get that, get that. You're just going to trust God, and that's what's so incredible, exciting. It's a mystery. What's He going to do? How's He going to do it? Where am I going to see that? You never know, and that is cool, and it's first church. God bless you. He loves you. This is Tavo DRC signing off for now. If you want to contact me, tcleadership at gmail.com. tcleadership at gmail.com. And then the giving would be on top of onlinefellowship.us, a little gold in a bar on the right. God bless you. Bye-bye.